What is the mesoscale? The word mesoscale, that's a term a lot of us have heard over the years. I'm going to take you way back to 1956. This is a paper by Theodore Fujita, the godfather of tornadoes. And isn't that a spectacular diagram? I mean, this is kind of unprecedented for the 1950s. And that's one reason Fujita became so popular his ability to visualize and depict weather systems. Well, this came from the paper Mesoanalysis, and this word had just begun being used around that time. The original use of that word was by a radar scientist named Myron Ligda. That was 1951. Well, fast forward to 1975, scientists had begun working with these definitions and trying to figure out how to best use them, and we ended up with this nomenclature, microscale, mesoscale, and macro, which is basically synoptic scale. I don't know if you can read this, but the division that was set at about 2,000 kilometers between synoptic and mesoscale, and 2 kilometers between meso and micro. Everything that was microscale had a time scale on the order of, well, go up to the top there, minutes to about one hour. The mesoscale processes, that's going to be these right here, thunderstorms, low-level jets, squall lines, those had a scale of hours to maybe a couple of days. And synoptic scale was everything else. Well, this has modified a little bit over the years. The division is more on the order of 500 kilometers to place those fronts in the synoptic scale up here. And the lower end, that's going to be about 10 kilometers. So somewhere in here. So basically, everything from 10 to 500 kilometers is your mesoscale. There's the surface chart we have this afternoon. Do we see any mesoscale processes on here? Sort of. This is more of a synoptic scale chart. Most everything we see on here has a scale of hundreds of kilometers. Systems that are smaller are going to be hard to find. Now this right here, that's a small scale tropical depression off the Carolinas coast. That's probably going to be in the mesoscale, just barely. And these thunderstorm elements down here along the Florida coast, this is kind of a synoptic scale depiction of those storms, but if we used more of a fine-grained depiction, that would be mesoscale. And the weather processes taking place in those storms are mesoscale and microscale. So very clearly, we have a polar front Coming in from the Pacific, moving into the central Rockies, a large band of rain and showers across Utah this afternoon, extending into northwestern Arizona. Some very cool temperatures in Nevada, 66 in Las Vegas, 51 up there northeast of Reno, and 60 degrees in the San Joaquin Valley. I wish we had some of that cold weather here. And we've got 50s all the way up the coast into Oregon and Washington. Temperatures certainly below normal in the western U.S. In the central U.S., we have a warm wedge. This is all tropical air coming up from Texas, the Gulf, and the Mexican interior. And temperatures are in the 80s and 90s for the most part. And up in the northeastern U.S., a stagnant weather pattern, the remains of an old polar system. We did have northwesterly flow in that part of the country a few days ago, and the air mass has just stagnated and not been replaced by anything from the south. Yes, it is looking a lot like winter up in Alaska. 972 millibar low around Bethel. That's that station right there with strong westerly winds in the Aleutians gusting up to as high as 38 knots. 
strong cold air advection coming back in behind this occlusion in the Gulf of Alaska, and the triple point found way to the south, about 400 miles south of Anchorage. Another wintry system making its way through the central Arctic. There it is up there near Cambridge Bay. And we're starting to see a lot more snow on these charts as temperatures fall as we approach the month of November. And yes, November is just three weeks away. And it certainly looks like it on the 300 millibar chart. This is up at about 30,000 feet. Strong polar front jet feeding that system there in the Gulf of Alaska. Remember, we were talking about that system. We had the occlusion uh, kind of in there, trailing off to a cold front about like that and the warm front about like that. And the position of that jet is in its classic location back in the cold air and flowing around north of that warm front. So our consistency with the upper levels looks pretty good. Now, what we see here is strong ridging in the eastern Gulf of Alaska with strong troughing on the west coast. So this is kind of a very meridional pattern. And we can also call that high amplitude. And let's see what happens over the next couple of days. We see a low shearing off in the central Rockies going into Saturday. And just barely starts to close off in northern New Mexico around Monday. Doesn't quite do it, and it looks like it's maybe starting to open up a little bit around Tuesday. And you also notice that the patterns are progressing. So it doesn't look like they're blocked very much. That trough that we saw there just moving eastward, and the ridge behind it following closely, and the next trough moving on to the west coast on Sunday. And that next trough looks like that digs in and shears off. And that's kind of been the story of vortex production over the past couple of weeks. The atmosphere seems to be very prone to break these pieces off. And then we get a cutoff low for a little while. So the next cutoff low right there, bringing us into a split flow pattern around midweek. So the southern system down there affecting Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and the northern system, well, that's going to be up in Quebec and Alberta. Round two coming in for late next week, mostly in the form of ridging, but you can see the next trough diving south around the weekend. And that doesn't quite shear off well. Yeah, it does, but it stays mostly up in the northern tier states. Well, it is a hot one today. These are official forecast highs. Stillwater, Oklahoma, 95. That's going to break the record for the date set in 1979. And Dallas tying the record. They're expecting a high of 94 today. And these are official Weather Service forecast highs. And just checking in on those values. DFW up to 91 at this hour. 93 at Oklahoma City and even 96 at Childress. So it is toasty today, for sure. Looking a little bit worse for tomorrow, I'm seeing about 56 stations tying, breaking, or coming close to the record for the date. Dodge City, that's the most prominent one, breaking the record by 5 degrees, coming up to 97, and similar story there at Childress with 97 and 94 at Lubbock. Those are all going to break records, and looks like a lot of stations in Kansas, too, also breaking records for the date. Fortunately, Sunday is looking a little bit better. The only record breaker, Evansville, Indiana, 89. So the heat is spreading to the east and to the southeast, and that's indicative of a little cold air working into the central plains over the weekend. Now you probably wonder why I don't show record lows. That's because we haven't really had any of them. It's been kind of a warm fall. However, we are expecting to come down to 31 at Bishop, east of the Sierra Nevadas. That's going to come close to the record. And 44 there at Redding, same thing. But everywhere else tonight, the lows should be pretty close to normals. 
Well, next week is going to be pretty turbulent, and the best way to see that is with the ECMWF Extreme Forecast Index. This is kind of a new tool that uses the ECMWF ensembles and paints the most significant weather. You're looking at a chart here for Sunday. Well, actually, this is for Saturday night, but the yellow and oranges, those are going to be above average temperatures. The orange, very much so. Green is going to be your above average precip. The blue is below average temperature. And in some places, you'll have a very dark blue, and that's a higher degree of below normal temperatures. And then the purple, that's going to be wind. And you're going to see that come in as the next weather system develops in the western U.S. So starting out, obviously, we have downslope flow. There's the low pressure area right there in the central plains with westerly flow coming in in the wake. So that's a plume of downslope adiabatic warming, and above average temperatures for Saturday. Then going into Sunday, remaining windy down there in West Texas. The next big system coming in from the West for Monday. There it is right there. You can see big wind problems in California and Nevada and cool temperatures in the northern Sierra Nevadas. Going into Tuesday, the wind and cool weather spreads eastward. You can see the blue beneath that wind plot there. So it's going to be kind of a cold one in the Great Basin region. Going into Wednesday, things spread eastward. There's the cold air in the wake of that system. And then for Thursday, it actually heads mostly to the northeast. So a lot of the southeastern quarter of the country is not going to see much from these systems. I guess it's just a little bit too early in the fall season. And that's the last frame I have. Things looking kind of quiet going towards the following weekend. And we'll take our satellite tour around the country, starting out in Southern California and Nevada. You can see down there in Arizona and Southern California, Jetstream Cirrus. That's it being carried northeast. And then further up north, we've got the mid and low clouds associated with the bare clinicity. Got that frontal system there. Remember that cold front kind of right there. And this is an anafront setup. So this plume right here, I think a better way to show that to you is on the infrared. Let me switch over to that. Well, we'll take a look at the water vapor imagery. It's probably a little bit better. But we can see the jet stream cirrus. We can see the atmospheric river kind of in this area right here that's associated with the warm conveyor belt, bringing up moisture into Utah. And then further to the east, we've got the cold core low. So the actual frontal system, it's going to be somewhere in here. So a lot of the strong frontal dynamics are going to be right there. The upper level low back further to the west. And we've got the deformation zone and wraparound up there in northern Nevada. And on the south side, dry slot. So that's bringing cool, windy, and clear conditions to Las Vegas and the Mojave Desert. So there's a closer look at the cold core convection in Nevada. You can see that the stronger convective elements favoring the clear area where there's solar heating, the atmosphere there very unstable. So we get some pretty good convective elements blowing up there in the northeast part of the state, north of Wendover. Looks like a nice day in Washington. Looks like they're in between systems, but right off the coast, a little bit of spiraling, low pressure area there. That's going to be a mesoscale low. I wasn't able to really pick that out very well on the surface chart, but it certainly shows up on the satellite. Very little going on in Texas, just a hot day. But it is pretty busy up there in the Great Lakes with a cold core low moving across the Chicago area, producing numerous showers and storms. Off the Carolinas coast, we've got a tropical depression area of disturbed weather. NHC is looking for a chance of development on that 40 percent 
And then the five-day outlook has that drifting slowly towards the North Carolina coast. There's the usual showers and storms in Florida. They look a little bit more sheared than usual, so I think they're a bit more organized. You can see those long anvils streaming off to the east. And if you take a look up here, just south of Jacksonville, south of Tallahassee, looks like an outflow boundary. You can see that driving south right there and producing new convective development. And I was just noticing this, looking at Saskatchewan and Manitoba here, looks like some wildfire problems in the very far south part of the taiga where the farming belts around Saskatoon meets up with that muskeg terrain. So they're having some issues there, it looks like. Pretty large smoke plume. And there's that powerful weather system in the Gulf of Alaska. Large plume of clouds and moisture heading up into southeastern Alaska right there. And then the clearing and cold air advection following in the Gulf itself. Let's take a look at that on the infrared. You can see those higher cloud tops really stand out. And on the water vapor imagery, we can see the very strong drying and subsidence in the wake of that storm. So some very strong vertical motions associated with that bear clinic system. And that's all for your Friday edition of Forecast Lab. Thank you for watching. And remember, on Monday, that's going to be the supporter stream. So if you're not a supporter, please head to our Patreon page. And if you're a supporter, you will rest easy knowing that you're supporting this channel and keeping it going into the near future. And for everybody else, we'll be back here on Wednesday. Hope you have a good one. Take care and we'll see you in a few days. Bye-bye.